Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. You who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what's not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what's good. And you're going to delight in the richest of fare. And give ear to me and listen so you may live. Now what Isaiah says there is think about the different things that you spend your money on. They, they satisfy you for a bit. But then there's something more you want. And Isaiah is saying, well, just, just go right to God. Go right to the giver. We're going to do that together in song, standing to sing four verses of holy, holy, holy. Let's go to our God in prayer. Father, next week we'll start thinking about who you say is blessed, and we just sang that you're blessed. Blessings upon the, the happy God. And Father, we ask that we would see you and your Son, your Spirit, even more that way. The most blessed, the, the happiest, the most joyful of all. And Father, so we would become more like you. That would do us good. We ask that we would see different ways that we are to become more like you and have confidence that we can. We ask all of this in the name of your Son. Amen. It's this God that welcomes you. May grace be yours and may peace be yours. And may these rest upon you and these come from the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and all God's peoples. And as God's welcomed us, let's welcome one another. Please be seated. We just saying holy, holy, holy. Um, we know God's that way. We know we're not. Uh, maybe you got a, a good friend that there's something about this friend you aspire to. 
And whenever you're with her, you're just like, man, she is such a good listener. And I, should, I could be a better listener. That, that's how it works with God's holiness. You, you encounter God as he is, and there's like, man, that's, that's lacking in me. And that's what sin and confession of sin and assurance of pardon are about, is bringing that to God. Rather than festering in, it, in shame in ourselves, you, you bring it to God and say, help me. We're going to be doing that together in song, singing four verses of Jesus paid it all. The basic idea behind that song is that Jesus does it all and it's in each of us to say, no, you know, I, I, add, a little, I add a little bit though. And we, we thought about that for a number of weeks with how is it that people are, are saved and we saw it's nothing in us. But once that life is in us, it does something to us. And I ask that you turn with me in your Bibles to Romans 12. Book of Romans, chapter 12. I'm going to read verses 3 through 8. And the idea here is that, that everybody who... That's, the, that's our, our disability slogan for the denomination with the RCA is everybody belongs, everybody serves. And the idea is if you've got God working in you, God's going to be working through you. So saying, okay, well, what can I do? Um, Psychological studies show just very clearly that people who serve others are the, the happiest people. People who want nothing to do with God and think religion is a bunch of nonsense will, will say, well, 
if you are feeling bad, think about what you can do for, for others and do that. And of course, God's wisdom is much more profound. I'm going to start in verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment. In accordance with the measure of faith God has given you, just as each of us is one body with many members, and these members don't all have their same function, so in Christ we who are, are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it's serving, let him serve. If it's teaching, let him teach. If it's encouraging, let him encourage. If it's contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it's leadership, let him govern diligently. If it's showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. And what Paul would say is you don't expect your hand to be doing what your eye does. There's different parts in the body. <clears throat> and what that means is every part of this body has a, a role to play and something that you contribute. And you might think, well, I, I don't know what it is I can contribute. But think about, I don't know, let's say you damage or injure the back of your hand. You don't realize how much you use that hand and bump it up against something until it's hurt. The same's true with a church. You, you, you contribute a whole lot more than you, than you think. And so the word here is to say, God, what would you have me do? What would be good for, for the body? So, <clears throat> we're going to be going to God in prayer in a couple minutes. First, a few announcements. First, thinking about contributing. You see these little lovely worship bags. They're right back there by the, by the mailboxes. I wanted to, wanted to thank, thank the individual who put this together, the people who put it together so much for using your gifts. Um, so often we'll have the sense, well, the church should, should do this. Yeah, but the, the church is, oh, it's always the people. Anything that ever happens in a church, some, somebody's doing it. Somebody's throwing themselves at it. So thank you very much for for doing that. It's a wonderful initiative. Also wanted to say thanks. Um, I think about this from more often than you might think, but I particularly think about it with um, back to school because my wife takes the kids back to school shopping. And I'm, I'm thankful for the financial support of this congregation for, for gospel ministry. Um, I mean, again, I think about that, but I think about it when my kids get new shoes for, for school. That's because this congregation supports gospel ministry. So I, I do want you to know it's appreciated. Um, been a rather busy week with, with prayer requests. I sent out emails about Kaylee and Garrett and Kerm and Linda. And we're going to be praying for each of them. We're also going to be praying for the Van Grau family. Josh's grandmother, Jean Post, passed away at the age of 96. And her obituary made clear she was uh, the oldest member of Ocheedon CRC. Rightly something to be proud of and a long life to be thankful for. So let's go together to our God in prayer. Father, you describe yourself as someone who raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. And some of us know what it's like to be down and out. Some of us know what it's like to hit rock bottom. And Father, hopefully we all have a regular taste of what it means to be poor in spirit, as we'll think about next week. Father, we'd rather not be poor in any way, shape, or form. We'd rather have everything going our way all the time. Uh, get a few years under our belt, we realize that's not how it, how it goes. We think about the various trials that you bring into our lives. We don't understand them, but we do know you work in and through them. We think about it with Kaylee and that she's been able to, to get more formula for a, for a period of time into the future. Father, it's always bracing to see what we see about in the news. This formula shortage affects somebody that we know or a loved one of somebody we know. And Father, remind us that Everything that we see on the news has to do with people and people who are just as real as we are. But we do ask that, you'd be able, that Kaylee would be able to continue to get formula. And Father, our brother Kerm finds himself in a position of, of difficulty right now as well. 
the break in his neck from the fall is uh, another setback and a, a trying year. We do thank you that it wasn't worse. Father, we do ask that he might be able to, that he would heal perhaps more, more quickly than, than even expected. He might be able to move about more freely. Our brother Garrett also finds himself in trials with uh, this need for a stint in his heart. And we thank you for the medical technology to be able to do something like that, but such an experience is still overwhelming. We ask that he might be able to come home soon. Father, we thank you for your kindnesses to Linda DeVries. We ask that she might continue to recover well. And Father, as we think about Kerm and Garrett and Linda, Father, I imagine to them, they were kids just a bit ago in some ways. As we think about kids heading back to school, Father, we remember that Linda and Kerm and Garrett, they were little kids once too. It's not too long ago in their experience that they were in second grade or in fourth grade. Some ways that goes by in the blink of an eye, in other ways it, it's a long life. It's a strange thing. But Father, we ask that you, te- that you would teach us to number our days so that we might gain a heart of wisdom. These three that we're praying for, they were once the same ages as the, these three young men who just professed their faith with the elders. And those young men are going to turn around to be Garrett and Kerm and, and Linda's ages before they know it. We ask that for each of us, we might seek to, uh, to do good with the, the years that you give us. And we do pray for the kids and young people as they head back to school. We pray for teachers as they finalized or are finalizing the, the look of their classrooms, uh, laying out lesson plans. Father, as they might have their own nervousness about a new year, we pray for those who will be teaching for their first year. And Father, those who are doing it for their 41st year, we want good for them and for the students and for parents of the students. We pray for those who are in the midst of transitions, some of us starting new jobs, some of us starting new responsibilities in our jobs, some of us planning weddings, some of us thinking about business changes, Father. This is a whole lot. Give us wisdom. Father, we thank you for the wisdom of your word for yesterday for the Van Grau family as they laid a grandmother and a great-grandmother to rest. And looking at her, her obituary, Father, it seems that she loved to serve. That is a virtue. That is a heroic virtue. Father, we ask that the family's memories of her might be sweet, might be encouraging. We rejoice with her that she's with you. And being the oldest member in a church is, is special, but Father, being with you, that's better by far. But still, there's, there's grief in this life, even when someone who's lived a long, full life passes on, Father, so be near the Van Graus. We pray for your continued comfort to be with the Faber family and the, the wider family with Chris's passing. And death hits us different ways at different times. There's some punches that we see coming, and there's a whole lot of left hooks with it that we don't see coming. But they certainly do land. Father, we ask that your goodness and your your steadfast love would, would be landing as well. And we know they will. And they'll do far more powerful work. And Father, we pray for ourselves in this week ahead. In a group of this many people, there's going to doubtlessly be some surprises in this week ahead, just like there were surprises for us in this last week. We ask that we might navigate them well, meaning for the the good of others and in ways that we have peace with. Father, we ask all of this trusting you and asking for your help to trust us, trust you more. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen going to be hearing God's word in a bit. First, let's stand together, and we're going to be singing as a a prayer, which really all songs are, singing, Speak, O Lord.
Please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter 1. the universe. You take a seat, please, before we pray. You got your neon green sheet here. Thought if anybody kind of slept in, this would kind of just wake them up. It's just so vibrant and lively. Um, what you see at the bottom, of course, we're going to have the different verses we're going to work through in the sermon. What you see at the, the bottom are different narratives to show God people seeking or avoiding God's voice. Um, the, the Bible stories, and if you're reading through the Old Testament now using that board, you come across a whole lot of lengthy narratives of history. What those are all about are just giving you life experience. That's a large part of what they're about. Let's say that you're a mechanic. When you first start, you, you don't always know what, what's going on. But by the time you've looked at your, I don't know, 2000s engine, you got a fair idea because you've seen it over and over and over and over and over again. You've seen different problems and you know how to troubleshoot because you've been around the block. The idea of the different narratives in the Bible is saying, let me tell you a story about life. That way, as you're living your life, you're going to be much quicker to say, maybe this is what God is up to. Right? That, that's the sort of experience these stories at the bottom are, are there, there to give you of saying just like you can pick out what's going on with an engine because you've looked at so many of them. So you can see, okay, man, this is a curveball in life. The situation is not what I would expect at all. Well, what, God, what might he be doing? That, that's what all those stories are about. But let's go to our God in prayer asking that we would be able to knit all that together. Father, so now we think about hearing from you and we ask, answer a question from an individual in the congregation that many of us have or have had or will have, particularly as we have decisions to make. We ask that you might give each of us wisdom. Father, that we might be, be listening as, as willing workers to say, the best thing for me would be to be near God and to know what it is he'd have me do. And so we changed by inches, but truly changed. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm only going to share this with you because this lady's now with the Lord. And I'm going to be sharing something with you that she, she told very, very few people when she was alive. And I'm not going to tell you whether I knew her from Massachusetts or from, from Maryland or from Minnesota, or from Michigan. This is actually the first non-M state I've ever lived in. So it's, it's... Years ago, this lady had a son who was in a war. And she was terrified about what might happen to him. Some of you know exactly what that's like. And her son would regularly send her letters. Letters from where he was based. Nothing confidential in it, of course, but just... Mom, I'm doing okay, those sorts of things. And then the letter stopped. And she waited, and there was no more letters. Well, as you put it yourself in her shoes, you'd be pretty nervous. She was worrying herself nearly sick one night and pleading with God, okay, I just, I'd like to hear from my son rather hear from him rather than, than about him. And she was doing the dishes and she heard her name. 
and she knew it was the Lord. He told her that her son would be okay. And that was the end of it. The end of her worrying about that, the end of her her hearing from God in that way. Now that this lady, she, she's not one you would expect by any stretch to have an experience like this. This, this lady is a wonderful lady. But I tell you this story because this ask away question is all about hearing from God. Now, there's two parts to it. First, the question asks, how do we know if we hear from God when it's often not audible? So when it's not like that lady experienced. And when we have, hear different opinions from Christians that we respect. And second, how do we improve on hearing from God regularly rather than being only focused on it when we have a difficult decision to make? My guess is you, you've asked yourself this question or you've wanted God to speak audibly to you like that lady he had. We're going to think about this with two points. And first, we're going to think about hearing from God. I brought up the story of, of this lady because that's the way we wish it would go, right? I, I hear directly from God in an audible fashion to my specific situation so I know exactly what's going on and what to do. But the person asking the question it is very clear that that's not the way it usually goes. That's part of the question. How do we know if we hear from God when it's often not audible? The, the, the question is, is saying, we, we're rarely, some of us, if ever, have such startingly, startling experiences. And so how do we know we're hearing from God? How do we know what we're supposed to be doing? The book of Hebrews begins by telling us how we should expect to hear from God. The author of Hebrews is very clear. I get that you want to hear from God, so I'm going to say, here's where you should expect to do it. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers in many ways and in different times. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son. So the Lord spoke to Abraham through an angel. The Lord speaks to Joseph through dreams. The Lord speaks to Gideon through a fleece. Could he still do that? Of course he could still do that. But the author's saying, expect to hear him in his son. I mean, Jesus, he's the sum and the substance of what God plans on saying to people. Meaning, if you've got questions about what God wants from you, you focus back on Jesus. You circle back on Jesus. You say, what in this situation would be different if Jesus was a part of it? What in this situation that I'm struggling with with my kid would be different if Jesus was in the mix? And because he says he is. I'm with you always to the end of the age. This is part of what George Mueller was after when he, he said that the, first, the great and primary business in which I ought to attend to every day. So get this. This, this is his saying, okay, I wake up this is the most important thing I do every day is to have my soul happy in the Lord. The idea here is if you want to hear from God, but you're not bringing Jesus into the equation, it's like you're trying to hear somebody on a phone, but you don't have it to your ear. You've got to keep bringing Jesus into the equation. Because God says, I'm talking to you all the time by Jesus. Be, imitating Christ is part of our vision statement because that's how you hear from God. You keep focusing on Him. His will for you is to become like that. So that's first. You, you prioritize Jesus. And second, you, you listen to where you, you absolutely know He speaks verbally, which is in His Word. God, he already gives the, the basic instructions of life, the intermediate lessons of life, and the advanced skills of life. He's already given all of them in his word. This is what Peter said shortly before he died. 
He said that his divine power has given us everything we need for godly living through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and grace. So how do we learn all these lessons for wise living? And Peter would say, you just got to keep opening your ears to what God says. That, that's the old hymn, what more could he say than to you he has said? To you who for refuge to Jesus have fled. Um, if you're a parent with, with little kids or if you're a parent with older kids, I'm sure it's the same. I'm sure my parents have told me the exact same things 10,000 times. But you, you'll give your kid an instruction and then there's all sorts of questions around that that really have nothing to do with doing the instruction. And it's like, well, no, the instruction is actually what's got to be attended to. And that's, that's what God's about, is saying, okay, no, let, let me bring you back. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, Pastor, <laughs> it's good that you get something out of the Bible because I don't. I've tried. I have tried my level best, but when I open this book, it doesn't talk to me. That's great. Some people are wired that way, but it doesn't talk to me. I mean, there's no page I can turn to to say, okay, when your kid's not paying attention to you, turn to page 867. That's not there. I mean, why isn't it laid out like Quora.com where people ask a question and there's just an answer? Why isn't it laid out like that? Well, the Bible, it's not, you're right, it's not written to give you specific answers to specific questions. Because there'd really be no way to lay it out to answer everybody's eight, all the eight billion people's alive questions. If you put your own expectations on it, you're, you're not going to get anything from it. Um, it. That's true with anything, though. Imagine a man. Imagine a man, his wife dies, and he, he gets remarried. And he expects his second wife to be just like his first wife. Finds himself very, very frustrated that she is not what he expects. Now that poor woman's not going to be able to do anything for, for that guy in any real way because he's not really looking for the right thing. Now if he got to know her for her, made it a point to listen to her for her, figure out who she is, he could gain a whole lot from her. But that's his choice. And the same thing's our choice with Scripture. Now you need to learn to listen to it on its terms, what it wants to say. I mean, the whole goal, the goal of Christianity is not to figure out how to get the Bible into your life. The goal is to say, how do I get my life into the Bible? So I start to think about myself a bit more like, okay, well, what was God doing in Joseph's life? Or, or what was God doing with David's life? That same God's still working. So that's, but that's, isn't that how it works with any real relationship? Any real relationship requires a whole lot of work to say, okay, what's going on with this other person? Why would she say something like that? And as trust is built, you can ask those questions and you really do figure out. The, easy, the far easier way is just to, just to make wild assumptions about what everybody else is up to. That's a lot easier. But you don't actually hear anything then. You just hear what you expect to hear. Or you say, well, there's nothing worth listening to because you're not listening. I mean, any real relationship takes time. And that's what we do every Sunday. We work our way through different parts of the scripture to say, how do we learn for God? How do we let God speak his way and learn to listen to him? Because we love him and we want to listen to people we love the way that they talk. And throughout Scripture, God keeps sending people who want to hear him in, for their situation. He keeps sending them back to Scripture. That, that's what Elijah, when he runs to Mount Sinai, that's what that's all about. Mount Horeb, it's the same mountain. He runs there because this is where people hear from God. 
and he needs to hear from God because it seems like everything God's told him to do is going nowhere. Not a point to any of it. So God, if you're actually, you know, I'm, I'm fed up, God. You know, there's a lot of people that could do this job too. How about you have one of them do it? That, that's where Elijah's at. So he goes to Sinai because this is where he knows people have heard from God. We're going to have it out, him and I. And he goes there. And there's great wind, a great wind on the mountain. And there's an earthquake. And then there's fire that's on the mountain. And what, he's, what God's doing is he's saying, okay, let me take you back to when I spoke to the people after the Exodus. Let me take you back to when the Ten Commandments came. Let me take you back to that experience. But, Moses, but Elijah didn't hear God in the wind. He didn't hear God in the earthquake. He didn't hear God in the fire. He hears him in a still, small voice because that's how Israel heard him, meaning I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. The question isn't, well, what did Elijah hear in that still, small voice? If only I could hear that. The answer is, Exodus 20 is what Elijah heard. The whole scripture is what Elijah heard in the still, small voice. He's just, God's just saying, I've already spoken. I've already spoken to you. What more could I say than to you I've said? So get back out there, buddy. I already told you. So the question, and the questioner certainly knows everything that we've already covered. And you might, most likely you know it too, but we do need to be reminded of it. The, the question also mentions hearing God in wise counsel. How do we hear from God when it's often not audible and we hear differing opinions from wise, trusted Christians when asked? It asks that because the, the questioner wisely knows that you do hear from God through other people, through wise people. David heard God through Nathan. Timothy heard God from his mother, Eunice, and his grandmother, Lois. Moses heard God's wisdom through his father-in-law, Jethro. You might have had, probably have, whether you know it or not, you have had situations in which if you have ears to open people who are godly and wise, that they have said something that God wants you to hear. But just listening to people isn't necessarily wise. You need to listen to the right people. Aaron listened to people. Aaron sought, godly, Aaron sought counsel in a pinch. And he winds up making a golden calf because that's what the people whose wisdom he listened to wanted. Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors they succeed. That's only true if you, you listen to people who have wisdom for that situation. In Rehoboam, he listened to people who, they had a whole lot of thoughts. Movers and shakers in the culture. He listened to them, loses half his kingdom. Peter, he listens to the wrong people about there's a division between Jews and Gentiles in the, the church. and You may need to make sure you're doing these six things too, otherwise you're not really, really a good church member. And he winds up having a huge blow up with Paul and making life difficult for a number of churches. So hearing from, from God, it's listening to the right people. You've got to say, okay, who really is wise? And more importantly than, than what, who would have wisdom for what to do, it's who has wisdom about me. Because hearing from God through others usually isn't about saying, what would you do in my situation? Because people usually don't have any idea what they would do in your situation because they're not in your situation. Right? Your situation probably is much more complex which is why you're wrestling with it. I mean, the easiest thing to do is to live other people's lives because we actually don't have to pay the piper. And when we have the sense that the other person is going to pay the piper, we're much more reserved with any amount of advice we would give. Other people's wisdom that God speaks to you through is almost, it seems to me, is, is usually about you getting out of the way. 
it's helping you get out of your own way because we all got sort of all sorts of weird assumptions. Okay, so you're wrestling with, okay, should I take a different job? Does this job isn't satisfying me. Should I do something different with my life? Okay, well, the assumption behind that is that your job really is about you being happy. Is, is that a safe assumption? Well, let's say you got a question, okay, what, what do I do with, with church? What do I do in church? I'm not, I'm not, not getting anything. Well, the, the assumption behind that is that church is about what you get. No, it's about what God's given to you. He's given you his own life. And how can you use that to bless these other people that you feel like you might not be getting something from? We've got all kinds of weird assumptions that just enter our minds, and usually other people's wisdom is about helping you get out of your own way. Now, let's say you've done that, though. Let's say that, like the question says, you, you've listened to other godly people, and they're respectable people, and you're still getting mixed messages. Well, well what do you do then? Well, you, consider, you could consider virtues. What virtues would be stretched? What virtues would be needed for these different decisions you're facing? Let's say that one of your opportunities is to take a job four states away. Okay, well, what virtues would that stretch in you? Are these virtues that you're really willing to, to grow in? Are you really willing to be hospitable, being in a new area, to seek to, to get to know others? What virtues do you have? What virtues do you want to grow in? Maybe you've got a question of, well, should I move closer to home to, to care for ailing parents? Well, the question there is, could you do that joyfully? Or are you going to do it begrudgingly? I mean, that, that's, that gets to the question of what's going on in your heart. You also think about, well, how does this decision impact others? It's not to say you should live for the approval of others. Proverbs says that's fear of man. That's going to prove to be a snare. You don't want anything to do with that. But there is a question of, okay, how is this decision going to impact others? Because that's just love. That's loving your neighbor as yourself in the sense of, okay, let's say that I take this different job. I, I've, got, I've got kids. How does that impact them? Or I've got, I've got grandkids in the area, and I might want to reduce the hours I work because I don't know how my health really is going to be in 10 years, and I want to make sure I've got time with those grandkids because there's things I want to instill in them. Or is this thinking there for about, about others? Or let's say you're part of a book study and there's somebody there that after every meeting grabs you for about 20 minutes and just lays out their difficulties and you're not really into the book study anyway. But you say, okay, how would it impact that lady? How would it impact her if I left? Now you might be thinking, okay, those are, are generally helpful ideas, but I want to know exactly what God wants me to do. And I want to know for sure. Okay, I think that's actually the problem. Unless a decision is sinful or obviously unwise, it is a valid option. And what we want certainty, what it seems we usually want is, I want to know that this decision is going to turn out well for me. I want to know if I leave this company and start my own business, it's going to go well. And I need God say so on that, because therefore I know it will go well, because I've heard directly from him, so I know I'll be able to financially be viable doing it. That, that's... that's Crave, that's just craving for certainty, which you're not going to get in this life no matter what. I, it seems to me that usually, not usually, but often the difficulty is we really don't know what we want. All right, so we want somebody else to tell us. All right, if you're a parent and you've got high school graduates, what do they want to know? What should I do, right? 
Because how do you, if you're 18 years old, what the world do you know about what you want to do? Okay, well, if you're 42 years old, how, how in the world do you know what you want to do? This absolute certainty. So you want somebody else to tell you. You want your parents to tell you. Or you want the Lord to tell you. This is exactly what you do. So things are going to turn out really, really well for you if you do this. But that's not, when you read the scriptures, that's not what God's after. He tells Abraham, okay, you leave this land, you go to another land, and none of it goes the way that Abraham expects in the least, but it is what God wants. God's interested in very different things in us. That's why when you read God's word, it gives you hints about, okay, what's God up to in this? Rather than about exactly what, what should I do? So that's just a little bit basics about hearing from God. You say, okay, well, well what, why do I want to hear from him? Is it because, is it to please him? Or is it because I need this, this decision to go well in the way I want it to go well? I mean, we're, we're all very good. I'm very good. I imagine you're very good at writing checks and trying to get God to sign it. You just put your hand on this dream of mine and you just sign that over, buddy. As opposed to say, what, what, do, you, what do you want? Because we're going to think more about that with, with what do you want and the second point and how to hear. Second point is hearing, hearing aids. All right? Some of us have hearing aids that pick up what's going on with, with sounds and we can hear better. Hearing aids here, how do you hear better from God? First is you pray. But you pray provided that you're obeying what you already know. There's not much point to praying to hear God speak to you if you're not willing to do what you know he said to you. All right, James, James says that's a double-minded person. He says that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. I remember working with a young guy. Young guy, he wanted to know, what is it that God wants me to do with my life? He's also consistently on drugs. I can tell you one thing God would want him to do with his life, but he was not interested in getting off drugs. So he really had no reason to expect that God was going to answer other things because this is a very clear thing for him to be working on. That's not to say God can't be bringing other things into his life and working around his unwillingness to obey in this area. But you've got to say, okay, am I willing to obey what I read in Scripture? Am I willing to obey the voice that I, I clearly know is from God? Do I have a heart that trembles at God's word and says, okay, let me take more in so I know what to do? I mean, if you're not willing to put your, your ear to the phone to, to hear from God, you're not going to have any reason to expect you're gonna, he's going to lead you in other ways. In some ways, we're, we're like, I mean, now with, with, Matt, with Google Maps, like, there's very few situations now where people won't stop for directions because you don't need to stop. But back in the day, I was, men were notorious for not stopping and asking for directions. And that can be us. Let me go, go, keep reading. Now, if you're willing to do that, and prayer then is very helpful because you are going to become much more sensitive to what God has to say. And the way I think would be really helpful is you just pray the Psalms. I mean, you've got a Bible at home. You've got everything you need to pray if you've got a Bible at home. You just open to the Psalms and you make them your own. Okay, you read Psalm 91. I'll say of the Lord, he's my refuge, he's my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And then you ask yourself, what do I want to run away from right now? Well, what would it be like to run to God in that situation? You're training the ins that voice inside your head to keep bringing God into the equation. That's what the Psalms are all about. Keep bringing God into the equation. 
Yeah, you feel like nobody wants to be around you. Keep bringing God into that situation. You feel like your life is a total waste and it's not turned out the way you want to. Yeah, there's psalms all about that that keep bringing God back into the situation. They're there to train your mind so you're actually knowing what it is that God says. And so then you read, I'm your refuge and your fortress, your God in whom you trust in a way that connects. So you want to be more open to the voice of God? You pray, provided you're willing to obey what it is that you already know. A second is you feel the right pressure. Because there's right pressure with the will of God and there's wrong pressure with the will of God. The wrong pressure is anxiety about a decision. Now, the wrong pressure is all the different what-ifs that come up. Rather, the Lord's will is never for you to be anxious, never to worry. You don't find that rare, you don't find that rare Bible verse where God says, well, yes, in this situation, worry is your best way forward. God's not just waiting to pound his children. 1 John 4, 18, there's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear has to do with torment. So if that's the, the emotional makeup of this decision of what's going on, you're going to need to be taking steps back if you do want to hear from God. Because you're not going to have a sense of what God wants you to do. What you're going to have is you're going to have a sense of what your own compulsions want you to do and you're going to say, that's God. You're going to have a sense of what your own shame wants you to do and you're going to say, well, that's God. You're going to have a sense of, here's what my own pride in the face of my fear. Like if you remember the, the old Back to the Future movies whenever Michael J. Fox's Carrot Marty is called a chicken, of course he's got no choice but to do something. Some of us do that in our own head. Well, chicken, you can't do that. You can't do that. Bok, 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 bok. And of course, that must be what God wants you to do. No, God would never treat you that way. We listen to a whole lot of things that aren't God. So the question then is, okay, well, what does God want done? And then the question is, can you honor God in the different decisions you're making? Because what we tend to want is we tend to want him to take a highlighter and highlight the one. When usually it's saying he's just taking a black marker and marking out the ones that are sinful or patently unwise and saying, take your choice among these. Right? It, it's, not, it's not you've got four options. One of them is exactly what God has you do and these other three are totally going to lead to total destruction. It's a sense of, okay, are any of these clearly sinful or patently unwise? If not, which of these three do you want? And again, that's usually the question we're into is we often just don't even know what we want. Well, the answer then is you choose the one that seems best and you honor God in that. Right? That, that's marriage. Okay, God, which of these four billion people of the other gender do you want me to marry? I want you to marry the one you choose and then I want you to do your best to do all the things that you ought to do for that person. I mean, that, that's how I know. The reason I know Bethany is the one for me is I married to her. She is now the one for me. That is God's will for me. This is the road that I'm on. But that's how it is with any decision. Marriage is just the, the, the more, more clear, permanent one of it. Or think about jobs. Right? You chose a particular job you're in. doesn't mean you need to do it forever, but it does need to be you need to obey God in that right now. That's clearly his will for you. And the reminder is you really can't know what it's like at that job that you didn't take. And you actually can't also know what it's really like at that job that you left because you're not there anymore. We tend to think we have this near omnipotent knowledge of all of these things when we have a very, very, very narrow scope which God just says, I'm going to light your path, meaning I'm going to give you just a little bit way forward. Here's the path you're on. Obey in that one. So you feel the right pressure. It's got two, two sub points left. Next is you widen your circle. New people, new godly people bring new perspectives. 
Right? You're getting to know a friend who recently buried her mother. You're going to learn a whole lot from her. You're getting to know a, a guy that you just think excels in leadership skills. You're going to learn something from him. Uh, Apollos, he was different after e- meeting Priscilla and Aquila. Boaz is different after meeting Ruth. So you cherish your old friends, but you, you op- be open to new godly voices because they're going to bring new perspectives to you. And the last one is you keep the main thing the main thing. That's 1 Corinthians 10.31. So whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, you do it all to the glory of God. This is about having your heart in the right place. Imagine a little kid who really wants to, to help clean the bathrooms. This little kid doing their best, but toilet bowl cleaner gets all kind of on the outside of the toilet. It's kind of actually more work than it would be for the kid not to help. Parent doesn't think so, though, because that parent knows that a kid's heart is in the right place. Those, those little errors, the, the, those don't mean squat to that parent, because that kid's heart's in the right place. God's a lot better at knowing whether our hearts are in the right place than, than we as parents are, and we as parents find it pretty easy to see if our kids' hearts are in the right place. If you've coached any sport, you can tell whether the kid's heart's in the right place when they're out there. I mean, your desire to hear God's voice and your willingness to act on whatever clarity you do have, that's huge. That's far more important than, quote-unquote, making the right decision. That's Proverbs 3 huge, as in, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And you lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, you acknowledge him. He'll straighten your paths out. Yeah, but I'm not 100% sure of, of what exactly is exactly right here. Are you trusting him? Are you seeking to acknowledge him? You leave it up to him to straighten the path. So my hope is that, not, my hope is now you've got new questions of thinking about knowing the will of God based on what you heard. You talk about those over dinner. Right? Talking about a sermon is never did I like it, did I not like it. It's always there was something from God in here for me to obey. Will I obey? That's, that's, that's what you talk about when you talk about sermons, whether it's Pastor Sam, whether it's me, whether it's your next pastor, whether it's Pastor Heilman, whether it's a guest pastor. It's always the sense of I've heard this from God. What, am I to, what do I do with this now? So all I've done is not the final word. I've just given you a framework to use. And that's the same framework that I would give that dear lady who heard God when washing the dishes. Because her son did come home for more, but she had a whole lot of other crossroads. That she buried that son. Not because of the war, because of a very rare form of cancer. She didn't hear God's voice audibly after that, but she did. She knew to hear him in his word. She knew to hear him in Jesus. She knew to hear him from godly counsel. She knew to hear him just by trying to say, okay, what, what, is, what is just not sinful in this situation? And she knew that he was going to work all things for her ultimate good. Well, you know that too. Let's go to him in prayer. And Father, we ask that you would be, well, we know you'll be with us. We ask that we'd be aware of it. Give us wisdom. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. We're going to sing together the six verses of Take My Life and Let It Be. Let's stand together.
offering will be, of course, for the work of this congregation and Special Cause Benevolence Fund. After the parting blessing, thinking about prayer, provided we'll do what God wants us to do. What a friend we have in Jesus. And now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with you all. Amen.